Far too often, we're naysayers as engineers, saying that we are unable to dictate how a building is constructed and reduce the carbon footprint of the design. However, I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. Good design and selection of the right materials still allows us to push the boundaries of engineering with an uncompromising design. And I'll be going through some ways that you can do as an engineer that not only reduces the cost of the project, making your client happier, but also reduces the carbon footprint. I'll be going through some of the major materials to reduce the embodied carbon in our designs. And also some design practice that will help you reduce the carbon and required material inside your structure. But first we need to go through and actually understand what actually affects the carbon footprint of our design. Basically built up of how things are fabricated and put together and where the most expensive part is. See, carbon footprints is not actually only associated with the fabrication and installation of the material, but also the transportation of the material to where it's located. So if you're shipping product from far away, it's gonna have a bigger footprint than local material. So one of the key aspects, especially reducing carbon quite quickly, is finding local material and sourcing that local material for your design and fabrication. The carbon footprint is also associated with the whole life cycle of the material as well. For example, if it takes a lot to break down to reuse it, that makes it more carbon heavy and something such as a steel fabricated element that can be quickly bolted off and reused. So this sometimes leads us down a process of what type of materials is easily dismantable and reusable as it will reduce the carbon footprint. And this is another area where some engineers even get tripped up when they're thinking about it. They're thinking about, okay, we want to try and future-proof our buildings. We want to put additional structure in there so they can don't need to make any modifications or changes to the design. Now, the problem with that is you're throwing more carbon into the design that is not needed currently and may actually never be needed by future-proofing that design. And the earlier you put carbon into the atmosphere, it has a compound effect over time as well. So it actually has a bigger impact than if you had to modify it later. So instead of going about adding additional features inside your design, you should actually be trying to go the opposite way wherever possible. So the biggest impact that you can have on design, especially early on and through scheming, is reducing the actual weight on your structure. So looking at the design actions, do you actually need to design for that 4 kPa? If we have a look at current office spaces, they have quite high floor loadings. However, with the current environment and the move to digital and the fact that we only have computers everywhere, the actual density and weight inside a normal office is greatly reduced. So we may be able to have a significant impact in reducing the actual carbon footprint of the building by reducing the capacity of each floor. And yes, at some point you may need some storage, but if you can locate it in significant areas, especially around columns, this will have a minimal impact to your design, allowing you to have that storage inside your office space by having most of the floor plate with minimal load on it. So first up, when you're designing a project, is looking at whether you can actually reduce the load that's actually applied to your structure, especially over a high rise, it can have a significant impact on your lower floors as the column would need to increase in size at the base and also reduce the footings that you need to put in. And not only that, as you reduce the weight on the floor, it also reduces that single floor plate. So this is probably one of the most significant impacts as not only does it reduce the columns, it reduces the floor design. It also reduces the stability forces from earthquake as well. So reducing the overall structure significantly. Also, what is the most costly part of a structural design? Columns are quite easy going straight through, but quite often we want to change that grid for a car park or a different floor layer. This requires a transfer structure. Transfer structures are typically very heavy and increase the cost of the design significantly and increase the carbon footprint. Starting off, wherever possible, is trying to line the columns throughout the whole building and trying to sway the architect from making those transfers. You may better make a slightly modified for location for the column that's not best for every location has a significant carbon reduction footprint through removing that given transfer on that floor. So as you can see, by having some minor design changes, by lightening up the loads that's actually applied to your structure has a significant impact. So just through some good design, you can significantly reduce the carbon footprint of your building through making these changes. If you're finding this content informative, enjoyable, don't forget to hit the like button. But not only does it get it out to more people, but also gives me confidence in the type of content to create for you. Now let's keep going with low carbon options for structural engineers. So why we're we talking about good design. Another way to try and reduce loads is shaping your buildings. Now I have done a whole episode on this. If you want to look into the latest about shaping buildings to reduce wind loads. However, by shaping your building effectively and doing some minor things like allowing air to flow through certain floors, 
shaping the building not to have those square catchy edges. Shaving off corners, this significantly reduces the wind load on your design. Shaping the building specifically to reduce wind loads, this is also has a carbon positive effect as it allows you to reduce the stability elements in your design, sometimes quite significantly. And when we're designing our structure as engineers, is not over designing certain elements. Most elements we can try and target as high utilization as physically possible. And even sometimes reducing some of those spans, maybe adding in some columns actually helps you out or removing them, playing with that design and doing your carbon calculation for what is the most efficient structure. So wherever possible is utilizing the structure to 99%. Now you may go, oh my God, so close to failure. This is where you need to consider what does 99% of structural design actually mean? Not only do you have multiplications on your loading factors, so you're timesing it by a loading factor, so you actually increase the load that's applied to your design. And if you actually look at the loads that are in those categories, you can see even the loads that are specified to be loaded on your structure are actually increased beyond what is probably physically there. But you also have a material safety factor as well. So even though you've loaded that structure to 99% utilization, there's still a long gap from that location to where actual failure mechanism will occur. Yes, some of those safety factors are in there for design construction areas or overloading procedures. However, you have still got a significant load before it has that failure. So as engineers, don't be afraid to load it up to 99%. Yes, you don't wanna go over, but loading up to that capacity wherever possible and as much as possible. To help you about to calculate the reductions you actually achieve through these changes to reducing the weight and the removal of these transfers, iStruck D or the Institute of Structural Engineers has re released a carbon calculator tool so you can calculate the impact of certain design changes and how they either increase or reduce the carbon footprint of the building. I recommend everyone going out there and having a play with it to see how significant changes can happen. Yes, it is tailored for the UK as that's where it's been built for. There will be similar changes to everywhere around the world. And even if you look in the back end, you may be able to slightly modify it to achieve it for your local area. Something that often gets asked as well well is what is the lowest carbon material that I can use inside my design? Unfortunately, there's not one right answer as different areas are suited for different materials. For example, something on the roof, it's a long span. And so you want to try and significantly increase the spans. So you want to try and lighten up your structure. So a roof structure is typically better to be either steel or timber. However, if you're looking down at the footings, you want a more durable structure. And that's where it's more suited for something like concrete. And then high rise similar with columns, concrete is better suited for those type of events. Wherever steel and timber may be suitable up to a certain point on a high rise building. So it's about choosing the right materials for your locations. So I'm going to go through some of the major materials and some ways that you can impact the embodied carbon inside your structure. I'm going to start off with masonry. Now masonry is typically used for your medium to high rise building buildings for either load bearing or non load bearing elements. And the first two is just some really good design tips and detailing tips. Firstly, what is the standard block size? So knowing what that standard block size is and making sure the openings are located at the standard spacings. This does two things. It helps reduce the construction time as they do not need to modify the blocks to build the building. It also reduces the waste as they would need to cut up the blocks to make them fit the revised alterations. Far too often, a masonry structure is very brittle and through any movement, it will be cause cracking. However, these cracks can be avoided or actually located where we need them to be. And that's through some placement of some good control joints. So when you're detailing up in masonry structures, making sure you're detailing the control joints to prevent the cracking that may occur later in the design. A lot of the time masonry structures will see significant cracking here and there, but may not have a significant structural impact to your design. However, a lot of people may actually see that and want that replaced. So the most expensive part is the cement that's made up inside that block for embodied carbon. So wherever possible, suggesting some supplementary cement material that they can use in the block design that will not have mineral to no impact to the effect of the block in strength, However, reduces the embodied carbon inside that block significantly. Another impact as well is wherever possible is doing unreinforced or uncore field blocks. As this has two impacts, it not only does it have additional cement in there, if you're core filling every block or putting steel inside your design, which has a significant increase to the embodied carbon, but also for that reuse situation. So if you've got the block in there, trying to demolish a building and reuse the blocks that have either core filled or got reinforcement in there makes it significantly harder, if not impossible. And one way to help increase the reusability of the block 
is not using grouts that are overstrength for what they need to. The harder the grout, the harder it is to get out and reuse. So only using grouts as strong as they are required for their significant purpose. Another costly feature of the block is the fact that it's fired inside a kiln. And there's actually a series of unfired blocks that can be used. Yes, they do not have much load bearing capacity. However, this really easily used for non load bearing internal walls. So if you've got an internal wall that doesn't need to take any weight. So try suggesting the unfired block wherever possible. This has two benefits. Not only is it reducing the carbon through not having it kiln fired. One of the biggest materials that's quite often used in the industry is reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete has a significant cost in embodied carbon. So whenever you're looking at design, is reducing the weight wherever possible. So how can we do this? There's a number of ways. So you can put some voids inside your zone or having decks with actually big voids in the metal deck, utilizing such things as post tensioning that allows you to thin up your structure. And here's a caveat. A lot of time with your post tension designs, you do have a higher cement ratio as you need to hit those strengths a lot earlier. So there's a cost benefit analysis that needs to happen. Yes, the post tensioning in there helps reduce the weight significantly, but that is at a minor cost to an increased cement ratio inside your concrete. On your taller buildings as well, sometimes we're putting puddle pours in or requiring higher strength concrete in columns or other elements. And we're normally specifying a 28 day strength material. However, if we can slow that down and reduce the sedimentation material inside a structure and, even, and requesting concrete testing or hitting peak strengths at either 56 or 72 days, you can have a significant reduction in the cement ratio inside your mix, but still hitting the design strengths that you require. Yes, this may require a little bit more monitoring and a bit more curing process, but a tall structure, especially on a column or a transmission through a slab, doesn't see those loads until significantly later. So if you're specifying a 78 day strength, there's no impact to the design. You have a significantly reduced carbon footprint through reducing the sedimentation material inside your concrete. Another one to look at, what is the most expensive part about your concrete? And that's something that I may have been slightly suggesting here. And that is the sedimentation of Portland cement. That has a lot of effect as not only do you need to dig it out, you need to process it, you need to kiln fire it. So there's a lot of embodied carbon inside that cement. So wherever possible is looking for supplementary cementation material. Now there is a series of these. These include silica fumes, limestone powder, volcanic rock, or other waste ashes. But if you put a combination of these, they can have a benefit through reduction. There's also certain admixtures as, as well that help you increase the concrete strength while reducing your sedimentation material. And it's even looking at potential alternatives to traditional mixtures. And there's a number of different materials coming out as well. So in short, for concrete, it's about looking at replacements to the Portman cement, reducing the amount of material inside your design and utilizing your structure to 100% wherever possible. So not oversizing elements. So looking at how utilized is a design, checking what's your M1BD squares. If you haven't watched that, look back at my post tension design. So for example, for a utilized beam, you want to try and be hitting somewhere around five to means it's got minimal amount of steel and is utilized as efficiently as possible. Another impact that you may not realize as well, so what is going to be more efficient, a rectangular column or a circular column? There's been studies out there that have shown that circular columns are a lot more efficient through reduction in the amount of steel in design as they have the spiral around it. So reducing the leak significantly and reduces the number of bars that you need inside your column. So wherever possible, moving away from those square and rectangular columns and trying to adopt a circular column. Another significant impact is the transportation of materials. So when you're thinking about precast elements is how big a precast element can we put on a truck? Yes, you may be able to get oversized ones by tilting them sideways, but this significantly reduces the number of precast elements you can have on your truck. And by looking at how big a materials and how efficiently you can pack a truck, you can significantly reduce the impact of transportation of that product from the shop to your site. And as the elements are fabricated off site as well, can you look at those increased 72 day concrete strengths, can you slightly slow down the transportation of the precast panels to site so that you can have a lower strength panel before it actually gets to site, thus significantly reducing the cementitious material inside your precast. Steel, now here's the tricky one. Now we still use more steel than we actually reuse. 
we actually reuse as much steel as we possibly can from different areas. Yes, we're trying to reuse it. We either reuse that beam or put it back into an arc furnace to melt it down and turn it into another structural element. However, at this point, even if we're to 100% utilize every steel structure that is demolished, we still need more steel. So people might just call out, let's just use 100% reusable steel. That only does two things. Firstly, it's, they're already doing that. So yes, your structure may be built from 100% reusable steel, but regardless of whether you are gonna specify that or not, you would've got some reusable steel inside your design anyway. So by specifying 100% reusable steel, it's so not having a significant impact. So when you're looking at designs, you're going for those utilizations wherever possible. What is actually governing your design? Is it dead load deflection? If possible, using pre-camber to try and to utilize more of the structure wherever possible. Instead of just having the steel structure in supporting the concrete building, turning it into a composite action will significantly increase the capacity, thus reducing the amount of steel in your design. Then also making those decisions, as we said earlier, if you can just demount a structure and reuse it, that significantly reduces the embodied carbon later on and utilizing steel wherever it's most appropriate. So those longer spanned areas with lightweight supports such as roof structures. If you do have a lightweight floor for whatever reason, a steel structure may be more appropriate allowing for those longer spans not having as much weight as what a concrete alternative would have. And timber design, it's about utilizing timber wherever it's most appropriate. It's similar to steel, it's a lighter weight product, leading it to lighter weight structures. So if you've got smaller spans that can cope with your timber design, looking at where that timber is sourced. If it's sourced from a long way, that transportation has a high cost to the embodied carbon inside the structure. So looking more towards those engineering materials such as glue lamp or CLT, as quite often we may design a specific structure, if we're using a hardwood timber, although it may look good and you think, well, it's stronger, so therefore it can span further. However, there's also lost materials when you're using those hardwoods and they're not easily replaced. So looking for those other alternatives, such as CLT or glue lamp, wherever possible. There's even other structures that can utilize a little bit of steel inside your timber structure. So if you've got a timber that's slightly less strong than what you need it to be, you're utilizing a little bit of timber strengthening such as post tensioning similar to what you do in slabs can also happen in your timber design also good detailing so what is the bane of any timber structure is the introduction of moisture that will cause it to rot out so wherever possible good detailing and waterproofing connections and looking at where that material is sourced is it sourced from a renewable source or is it logging old growth forests that can also have a significant impact on your carbon capture as well. Yes, timber does seem like one of those great products as the trees have grown up, pulled carbon out of the environment, and then you're putting it inside your design to make it live there for a lot longer. And then they grow up new trees and do it again. However, timber does have some downfalls and you're just making sure you're detailing around it to try and reduce the carbon impact of your timber design. And especially high rise, they're building a lot higher buildings now out of timber products. So even if you've got a concrete structure, the top half of your building may actually be able to be designed out of timber. This has a couple of benefits as well. Not only it reduces the impact of the cementaceous material above through replacing it such as timber, but it also reduces the weight on your design. So you may better actually go higher on a smaller structure. So it has a dual benefit here. There's actually been studies sometimes that you're actually able to achieve a number of series of additional floors through producing a lightweight option such as timber or steel to your design on the higher floors. And by integrating all these different options, both looking at the weights of the designs, removing your transfer structures wherever possible and utilizing materials where they suit best and these good detailing practices, you can have a significant reduction to the amount of embodied carbon inside your structure. So I would say us as engineers, we do have that responsibility to educate our clients. Not only do they get a better design that's potentially cheaper and easier to build, it also has a reduced carbon there as well. Is there any other ways that you feel that you can reduce the carbon footprint to your design? Please comment below. And if you have found this content enjoyable and informative, hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed and interested in structural engineering, hit the subscribe button. And to get all updates, you need to ding the bell. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.